Hello, I'm Garrick, and I don't have a bucket list, but if I did, seeing Metallica in concert would be at the top of it. I'm Timothy, and that would be on my bucket list as well. And uh, speaking of crazy things that uh, you don't expect to happen, um, that, <laughs> that being one of them, yesterday we had a car drive through our front yard at 50 miles per hour and take out the house two doors down from us. And so we're still a little bit in the aftermath of that <laughs> at this particular moment. As you may have guessed, in this episode, we are finally, after three years of this program, we are finally talking about Metallica. And you've got to understand the reason we haven't talked about Metallica is not because we don't really like Metallica. It's precisely because we do like Metallica so much and we wanted to carve out the space. If this has to be a double episode, it has to be a double episode yeah. on Metallica. We are both big Metallica fans and this the past two or three weeks I just read a bunch of biographies about Metallica and listened to a lot of Metallica music and all the time I was saying it's research it's research it's research <laughs> yeah that's why I'm that's why I'm on YouTube uh, for this many hours a day it's all research to kick it all off to kick off our discussion of Metallica we are going to uh, have our first installment of Behind the Covers. That's right, Behind the Covers. Let me explain it so that you uh, understand that this is a family show. Uh, behind the Covers is um, the segment, the, the quirky segment of our music episodes in which we will uh, pit two or more bands head-to-head uh, -head on um, who, who performed a particular cover song uh, better than the others. And in this episode what two covers do we have for them timothy well it is two of our favorite bands metallica and van halen we know mm -hmm. it's going to be a difficult decision right there because these are already two of our favorite bands and it's it's a cover of of a song that was written by ray davies for his band the kinks in 1964 and the name of the song is you really got me. And this particular song has been done by Van Halen and it has been done by Metallica, the Van Halen version. We all know it has the introduction of eruption that leads yes. into it in 1978. That was a moment whoever, whenever you heard that album the first time, even if it was years later, which it was for me, you realize that something changed about music in that album. But then there's another version of the song by Metallica. In 2010, they did a version with the original writer of the song, Ray Davies, the person who originally wrote the song. They did a cover version of it with him. And we've got to decide which is better, Van Halen or Metallica. Folks, you have no idea how difficult a choice it is between Van Halen and Metallica. Garrick, what do you think? Well, before we get into this, um, I do have an objection. I'm I'm really confused on why we didn't uh, include the versions of this song from Oingo Boingo and the Chipmunks, who also did two covers of this. I mean, I thought we were trying to, you know, like of the field, who did the best version, but you, know, you didn't even put those two into consideration. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm offended, or someone's offended. Some some Oingo Boingo fan out there, super fan, is going to be. We're going to get hate mail. That's what's going to happen here. The only thing we said, kind of pre-recording, is this is this was a, a far more difficult decision than I thought it was going to be. And in the end, where you land, I really feel is is heavily dependent on how you um, kind of rate what makes a good cover. And so um, I will, yeah, as I'm thinking through it, I'm like, okay, Van Halen, you have the intro, which is, you know, fantastic. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it is quintessential, Eddie Van Halen, right? Um, and it's just, a, it's a thing of beauty. And then when Van Halen performs the song, um, they make, they make it theirs, right? It, it is distinctly Van Halen, but also Van Halen, just, just their, their sound, especially with David Lee Roth as the front man, um, sounds a lot more like the kinks, right? It's, it's a, it's a glam rock, uh, twinge on uh, on the song, and so it's it's this great Van Halen version that sounds pretty close to the original. Um, even the vocals, uh, kind of uh, from start to finish, and has and has a few Van Halen esque 
uh, um, parts of it, right? Well, then you get to Metallica, which is I had it, uh, I had never heard this cover from them before. Um, probably because I don't I don't spend as much time on YouTube as Timothy does. Uh, he's got older kids, more time on his hands, things like that. Um, and so I didn't know what to expect, uh, kind of where they'd go with this. And uh, I got to start by. Uh, a lot of folks say, I didn't think, I didn't know how this was going to work. And that's where I was. But in the end, like it was fantastic. So then after, you know, spoiler alert, sorry, after Hetfield kind of does the first verse, then Ray Davis is his himself kind of is a part of it. And, and as part of this recording, and that just kind of adds a, a fun kind of reminiscent um, part to it. So in the end, super close, um, but in my heart, I gave Metallica the edge a little bit in my heart. Yeah, I think it, it does reveal what we like in a in a cover. What I like in a cover is one that actually changes the song for the future. So I think yeah. of one of the great covers of all time, Jimi Hendrix's uh, All Along the Watchtower mm. uh, from Bob Dylan's song. And even Bob Dylan admits that Jimi Hendrix's version is now the definitive version of the song. So, yeah. so I, I think about that. When I think about this song, here's what I noticed when I listened to the Kinks version, followed by Van Halen's version, followed by Metallica's version. Okay, I what fl- I noticed I that. at okay. that point. So you did it differently. Okay, I, maybe I it, it would strike did, you differently. I did it. Kinks, uh, Metallica. Um, yeah, Kinks, Metallica, Van Halen. Yeah. So here's what I noticed as I listened to it in that order is that the Metallica version has been shaped at some level by the Van Halen version. In other words, that Van Halen version was so much in their minds Mm. that there's some things they pick up from the Van Halen version that they pull into their own version. And what struck me is, my goodness, if Van Halen's version is so influential that it can influence Metallica Mm. With the original author of the song (laughs) together, if it can influence them, that's a great cover. It really is. If Van Halen could do that, their cover was so powerful, so ubiquitous, it became so well known that even Metallica and the original writer of the song can't escape being shaped at least a little bit by the Van Halen version. But in the end, these are both incredible versions of the song. They really are. Yep. You know, for the longest time, the uh, Van Halen, so the Van Halen version was the first one I had heard. Um, I mean, being, uh, you know, uh, released in the year of my birth. Um, so it was the first I heard. And for the longest time, you know, the version that I knew, I, I, I thought Van Halen, it was their song, which really speaks to another thing that Timothy and I mentioned um, talking before recording is that the kinks are just criminally, criminally underrated uh, in, at least in the States. I mean, you go look at their songs on, on, Apple Music or wherever you go look at songs and it, it, their top songs are just like, oh, these are like, these are some of the greats, the all time greats of rock and roll. Yeah, they really are. I, I think the, the Kinks are one of those bands that influenced so many other bands and yet they themselves didn't get nearly as well known as they should have. So let's talk about the first time that we mm. heard Metallica. So let's think about this. Let's go back. We're talking about Metallica today. And what is the first time? Well, when I think about Metallica, first off, they are one of my four favorite bands. For the past about 30 some years, I've had four favorite bands that have not moved for those 30 years. Metallica, King's X, U2, and Van Halen. The order <laughs> that those are in may change at times, but but and and you know, I'm one of like four fans of the band King's X that's that is in my top bands, but those are my four favorite bands. So Metallica is one fourth of my top list of bands. And when I think of Metallica, I have to first think of just my first taste of heavy metal. And that was, wasn't really heavy metal, but it was on the edge of that. And that was Def Leppard's song, Rock of Ages. I heard that. That was my first introduction to really hard rock. And it was the first time I heard a hard rock song played forward. Now, I'd heard a lot of them backwards, but I hadn't heard any <laughs> forwards. And so just for those of you who haven't listened to the program before, I was yeah. raised in this very fundamentalist kind of sect 
uh, almost cult, in which one of the things that happened a lot, and this bizarre level of a lot, was that we'd have people come to our churches who would bring a record player and they would play the records backwards to show us that there were satanic messages in, on these records, uh, that these bands were putting satanic messages. I heard so much heavy metal backwards in the first several years of my life. But then I remember I was in a car with a friend and he put in Def Leppard Rock of Ages and I had never heard anything that heavy. I know it's not that heavy really, but I'd never heard that type of kind of anger of, of just intensity to the music ever before. And I was hooked on that. That was like this, this is amazing. I have got to find more of this. And remember at this time, for those of you who may be younger than we are, hard rock and metal were not on hit radio. So after nope. the decline of album oriented rock in the 1970s, so that, that format album oriented rock kind of declined at the end of the seventies. And then the rise of top 40 radio in the seventies and eighties, heavy metal, and hard rock did not get played on the radio at this time in the 1980s. The only place I could hear it was on a college radio station, which for me was in Manhattan, Kansas, and it was Wildcat 91.9. Shout out to Wildcat 91.9 <laughs> in Manhattan, Kansas, <laughs> because I would listen to that, and that's where I would get metal and hard rock, as well as on Sundays, which was just a, a really interesting thing, they would play Christian rock and metal on Sundays on this particular radio station. In the, in the 1980s. And so that was where I heard for the first time Metallica many years after, about, uh, it was in 1987, probably 88, that I first heard Metallica. Uh, and I heard the song Four Horsemen from Kill 'em All. And that was just amazing to hear that. That was the first song I heard of theirs. And from that point forward, Metallica to me was just the pinnacle of, of what music got to be. I'd heard of Metallica before then, but that was actually the first time I heard a Metallica song it was 87, somewhere in 1987, hearing Four Horsemen from the Kill 'em All album on Wildcat 91.9 College Radio in Manhattan, Kansas. That's, uh, that's fun. Um, so I, I think I've said this in the past, but for whatever reason, for whatever reason, Timothy's uh, brain is great about just like re remembering moments and even being able to put dates to them and, and all those things. And I just I can't do that. Uh, but this is one. This is one of those times where, oh, it's it's clear as day. It was 1988. So 10 year old uh, Garrick sees Metallica's first ever uh, music video, uh, which was a, a video for their song one, right? It was the, their first video that they made releases in, in, in 1988. Um, and it's actually, it's that video, uh, which uses, uh, largely it's made up of clips from a 1971, um, film, uh, uh, Johnny got his gun, Johnny, get your gun. I mean, it's, I still have never seen this movie um, because the video is disturbing enough. <laughs> it's disturbing enough that I never felt like I needed to see the movie. Um, and it, it was just such a powerful video. Anyways, this is the video that catapults Metallica into the top 40 for the very first time. Um, and so that's the first time I ever heard Metallica. I, I can't say it, whether I remember it was the first time that I'd heard hard rock, you know, metal of, of, uh, of any sort. I don't remember that. Um, but then I become a fan like the rest of the world, but I mean, give me a break. I was only 10 years old. Like the rest of the world, I actually become a Metallica fan three years later when they release, uh, what we call the black album in 91. And, and then kind of, it was over after that, right? Like I went and found, everything I could find of Metallica and, um, and just kind of became a lifelong fan. And one of those lifelong fans that can also, um, acknowledge that there are, they've had some albums since then that were less awesome, you know, but, uh, but yeah, still going strong. 
So this episode of Three Chords and the Truth, we are looking at one of the songs on the Black Album, which of course is not really called the Black Album. It's just named Metallica, Metallica but we all yeah. call it the Black Album. It's like the Beatles' White Album, uh, for example, and Led Zeppelin IV, Runes, whatever you want to call that particular album, those there. So it doesn't actually have the name that we call it. We call it the Black Album, but we're looking at the song, The God That Failed. And what we're really going to be wrestling with as we talk about the theological implications of this this is, did God really fail? But before we talk about the God that failed, we've got to talk about just the number of Metallica songs that are based on the Bible. There are yes. so many uh, that are, and some of them clearly, uh, explicitly, sometimes quoting yep. from the Bible in these songs. Yep. Yeah. Well, if it's not direct quotes, the, the imagery, I mean, the explicit direct from imagery is just all over the place all over the place. Um, and it's always, it's always fascinated me. Um, and never taken the time to look into, um, why that is. And, uh, I've always assumed that it was largely tied to something going on with Hetfield. Um, Hetfield's always been this strong presence, uh, that you could tell, uh, without even going kind of f deep into any type of research. You could just tell that that there are deep waters there just always have been able to see that. Um, and as he's gotten older, I, I think that's become just more and more, um, apparent. So yeah, it's, it's, um, I'm excited to record this episode just because, Oh, uh, you know, this is always something I've thought about and have never taken a bunch of the time to go see what it is that's going on there. So we have songs, for example, like The Four Horsemen, which is from Revelation 6. It's very clearly from Revelation 6. We have the song Creeping Death. Uh, Creeping mm. Death uh, is drawn from Exodus. And even you look at the lyrics of that. Slaves, Hebrews, born to serve the Pharaoh, heed to his every word, live in fear, faith of the unknown one, the deliverer. Wait, something must be done. 400 years. You've got some very specific details right there from mm. Scripture. The 400 years, the fact that they're looking for a deliverer to come and rescue them. And it's unclear, is it is it God? Is it the angel of death from God? Is it Moses? Is it Jesus? We, we don't really know. It leaves it ambiguous, but you have this deliverer here. And so I want us to first just think about why is Metallica even quoting the Bible? How does Metallica even know about the Bible? How do they? Then you're right. It has to do with, with James yeah. Hetfield, who, of course, plays rhythm guitar, vocals, does most of Metallica's lyrics. And one of the things we have to understand to understand James Hetfield is that his parents were very strict Christian scientists, and they lived in near Los Angeles and were very strict Christian scientist. His father in particular was a very faithful Christian scientist, but also a deep reader of the Bible. One of the things mm. James Hetfield said at one point is whenever my father talked to me, it would be in scripture. His father Man. would talk to him about and in the scriptures. He talks about how his father would read the Bible and weep as he's reading the Bible. And so James mm. Hetfield grows up with a very clear understanding, at least of hearing the words of scripture. But let's think Think for a little bit about Christian science. This is a good opportunity for us to talk about apologetics with Christian science yep. and how, how do we engage that? How do we understand that? Yep. Christian science is a little bit like grape nuts. And what I mean by that is grape nuts aren't grapes and they aren't nuts. Uh, and But yet they're, they're called grape nuts. Um, right. And in the same way, Christian science isn't science and it isn't Christian, but it gets called Christian science. And so we've got to understand Christian science about yeah. this. And so now you've got, and, uh, yeah, Christian yeah, science is like we, grape nuts. If we were a Wikipedia article at this point, we would say um, not to be confused with Scientology and we would link you to something completely different. So it's, it is, it's important that, to know that those two are very different things. Um, uh, yeah. So not to go down any rabbit trails. Yeah. And, and it also is not a cereal, uh, even though we've used that analogy right there. <laughs> right. right yep. Not to be confused with a cereal. So right. to understand Christian science, we really have to think about the late 19th century. There's a height of this movement called American transcendentalism. And there is a lot of emphasis on healing with your mind. To us, this sounds crazy in so many different ways. But remember, medical 
knowledge was still growing at that time. And a lot of times somebody would be as likely to get well as not to get well if they went to <laughs> right. a doctor at that right. time, especially. And, and so there was a real emphasis on mind healing, yeah. healing <laughs> through your mind right. to think not, your way into being, into being that's well. That's right. Yeah. Not like, not like, you know, telepathy. I'm, I am, I am healing other people with my thoughts, but like, right your mental state your mental state having so this inter this inner thing a mental state um having a an effect a result in the in the external right so the material if the material world here here's kind of some um uh, some kind of fundamental uh beliefs be behind some assumptions behind what's going on right that one the material world is actually a result of your mental state okay so that sounds weird but but reality um, as you see it uh, is what it is because of how you're constructing reality in your mind right w what you're seeing what you're experiencing on the outside isn't real it's not what's or it's not what's really real um, it, in some sense and again, like so many things we talk about, there's a spectrum of of how people would explain this within Christian Science, but um, but largely a lot of what you see and experience and whatnot is is a bit of an illusion, um, is is one way to say. Um, and and a second uh, kind of a second fundamental is that prayer brings about healing, but it's prayer. This prayer is different than what's coming to your mind when you hear this, right, Timothy? Right. So it's like we think about prayer as a petition or a supplication, mm -hmm. asking God to please help us in some way, guide us in some way. That's how we think of prayer. That's not what Christian scientists mean when they say prayer. Prayer for them is sort of an inner argument, an inner dialogue of becoming convinced that matter is unreal. So you're trying to convince yourself that the material world is unreal and that there is no person to be healed. There is yep. no real material body. There is no matter. There is actually no illness. The first Matrix movie as it comes out and when when Neo is is visiting the Oracle and he's sitting mm -hmm. in the waiting room and uh, there's uh, and he's sitting next to the child who's, you know, bending the spoon, doing the tricks and whatnot. Um, and, uh, and Neo gives it a crack and isn't able to do what the same thing the child is. And, and the child s gives him the secret. And that is realizing that there's no spoon, right? It, it doesn't exist. It's something that is, it's a, a non-reality outside of yourself. And once you realize that, once you realize that it's just a, a figment of your imagination, but it's a figment that you uh, can control. And you can, since it's coming from your mind, then with your mind, you can do whatever you want with it. And that's, uh, in a sense, <laughs> uh, that's a bit like what the, the kind of mm -hmm. prayer, healing prayer that we're talking about. Yeah, and this all begins in 1875 when Mary Baker Eddy publishes this book called Science and Health. And by the end of the 19th century, Christian science is actually the fastest growing religion in the United States, believe it or not. There are 270,000 members of the Christian scientist movement by 1936 than the census of 1936. Over a quarter million people believed all of this and were following all of this by 1936. Now, it was on decline from that point forward, but nonetheless, there are a significant number of people who still believe this. And James Hetfield's parents back in the 1960s and 70s believed in this particular this particular perversion of Christianity, this particular uh, teaching, this cult, we might say, in some sense, even to the point that he had to get a waiver not to participate in health or phys physical education classes, because in, in those, he would learn things that were contradictory yep. to Christian science. And so that was the context in which he grew up. His father devoted to Christian science, reading the Bible, but reading it through this very twisted lens of Christian science. And then he wasn't allowed to participate in anything that would challenge that 
in his school or in his uh, daily life. And so in 1976 came sort of the first blow to him when his parents divorced and his father abandoned them. He talks about this a lot of times in interviews about how his father wrote a note to the family, but it wasn't even written to him. His father just gradually, his stuff started disappearing and then he was gone. He was abandoned. And so this father who had been really faithful in Christian science divorced his mom and left the family. But then the real blow came in 1979 when James Hetfield was 16 and his mother was diagnosed with a very treatable form of cancer, but she refused medical treatment. And instead she relied on Christian science, quote unquote, prayer to be Mm. healed. And Christian science doesn't actually forbid people to seek medical treatment. But what they tell people is that the healing prayer works better without medical treatment. And so she really believed that she followed Mm -hmm. that. And so she died of cancer because she put her faith in this religion, this faith that actually didn't produce what it said it would produce. And so he learns the Bible through this twisted faith. He loses his father, his mother dies And these are the things that really shaped James Hetfield. And after this, he moves in with his older brother and he, his older brother has a, has a set of drums and he plays the drums and then he eventually switches to guitar. So it's really similar at that point to Eddie Van Halen and Alex Van Halen. Two uh, switches from drums to guitar that music was made better by, right? Like, can you imagine what the history of music would look like without, without those two Uh, occurrences. And there's a couple of different movements in music that were happening at the time that Metallica started. And one of those is punk. We talk a lot about punk from time to time. I don't think either of us are real huge punk fans, but yet it has a real effect on music. And we talked about the Kinks earlier. The Kinks weren't a punk band, but they did have a lot of the attitude of punk music. And so they really kind of pioneered some early forms of music that would get picked up by those who were the punk artists. But the punk artists are like the Ramones and the Clash, pretty much anyone early on who has the before it. So the Kinks, the Ramones, the Clash, the Cure, the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, that's all all punk. Anything that has the in front of it is, is punk, except for Southern Seminary, which isn't. But uh, <laughs> nonetheless, um, so punk, so, <laughs> so punk. punk. <laughs> and so it was just this reaction, really, against how polished rock had become. Think about what was going on. There was this whole notion of of people doing amazing guitar stuff, like Jimi Hendrix and 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 so on, like that. And there was all of this music was really, really produced. Queen, Led Zeppelin, lots of production. And so those that were into punk, what they were saying is, look, we're done with that. We're tired mm-hmm. of that. It's gotten overblown. It's become this huge establishment. We want to strip everything back down and go to the essence of rock and roll. And so they created punk, which was this do-it-yourself, stripped-down, fast angry music. And the whole idea was to start over from nothing. Of course, it's absurd. You can't really do that. You can't start from zero. But they said 1976, when punk begins, is year zero. And uh, we're going to ignore everything that happened before us. And we're going to go forward and have anger at every existing system, reject everything. This is the punk movement. And the punk ethos is this fast, angry, stripped down music. So that's one movement that's going on when Metallica begins. The other one is the new wave of British heavy metal. So some people call it Nobwam, uh, N-W-O-B-H-M, in Wabam. Uh, and I found that out. I didn't realize that until I was in Australia and I found out that they pronounce it the, as a word that when they're talking about music. So it was kind of okay. like uh, ACDC in, in Australia. They call them Akadaka. Uh, they talk <laughs> about new wave of British heavy heavy metal, they actually pronounce that. So I don't know if this is just an Australia thing or what to pronounce everything, yeah. but I, that was the first time in Wabam uh, that I heard it as a, pronounced as a word, but it's the new wave of British heavy metal. And that's kind of the next step on the path that started with Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath is really what it is. So you get these mm. two movements, punk and the new wave of British heavy metal that are happening at the same time that Metallica starts. In the new wave of British heavy metal, there's a lot in their lyrics of mythology and fantasy, drawing from Lord of the Rings and from science fiction. Some of the later ones, they have all sorts of satanic imagery in theirs. Their shows are really theatrical with outrageous outfits and kind of medieval and classic 
classical themes. These are bands like Iron Maiden and Diamond Head that really mm. tried to have these complex song structures. But here's the thing is that punk and new wave of British heavy metal were at opposite ends of the spectrum. They are the opposites of each other. One is doing stuff big, theatrical, amazing guitar work that are doing these harmony guitars, all these things like that. That's a new wave of British heavy metal. Punk is simple, stripped down, no guitar solos, uh, against the establishment at every level. You have these two extremes here. And in the midst of this, 1981, Lars Ulrich, who of course is the drummer in Metallica, he puts an advertisement in a Los Angeles newspaper and wants to jam these new wave of British heavy metal songs. He wants to find somebody to play these songs with him. And uh, so this is Lars Ulrich. He's looking for somebody to do this. In the midst of this, he went to Metal Blade Records early on in its history and asked if his band could record a song for their upcoming compilation, which was called Metal Massacre. Now, here's the problem with him asking that he didn't actually have a band yet, but he got signed to be able, or at least got an agreement for him to be able to put this song on there from his band that didn't yet exist at this point. And so they did, <laughs> actually. And so we end up with this. This is the beginnings of Metallica. This is one of the interesting things about Metallica. It doesn't have any earlier name. It's not like most of the bands we look at, they had some earlier name and then they eventually got the name that they, that they have. Metallica is the only name that Metallica has ever had. And it's the thing if, when you have a name that awesome, yes, you don't need yes. another name. That's you do right. not need another name at this point. And so the name Metallica, actually, it was a reference book in England that was published that was about heavy metal bands. It was this really obscure reference book about heavy metal bands. And Lars Ulrich had a friend who was getting ready to launch a fan magazine. And he said, should I call it Metal Mania or should I call it Metallica? And Lars Ulrich said, oh, Metal Mania is a much better name, not because he thought it was, but no, because he heard he Metallica yes. and he wanted to name his band Metallica. So he yep. took Because, <laughs> you know, if they landed on Metal Mania, that wouldn't have stopped, like the story would be who knows what their name would be today, but their story, it, hey, their original name was Metal Mania. And then they and realized, they realized that, that was a terrible name. name. <laughs> Good name for a magazine, terrible name for a band. Yeah, that's funny. So they had Lars Ulrich and James Hetfield uh, answered that, but also they ended mm -hmm. up adding a guy named Dave Mustaine. Ooh. Dave Mustaine as their other guitar player. And uh, he came and he showed up for the audition and he was sitting there just playing around on his guitar and they looked at his equipment. He had a great guitar, great amp good pedal board right. and he said am i going to audition or what and they said now nah, you've got the job <laughs> you, you got the gear you got the job you have awesome equipment and so they they recorded this demo uh called power metal was the name of the the demo mm. and it is both immature and amateur <laughs> it really yeah. is That's the metallica that recorded that would never have we would never be talking about that metallica it was about <laughs> sex and kind of this macho metal some of the lyrics on one of their songs were our fans are insane gonna blow this place away with volume higher than anything today <laughs> yeah <laughs> these yeah. these are not the lyrics that persist uh, because it no. was just way too mindless <laughs> for the new wave of british heavy metal which was doing fantasy and side Sci-fi things like that, but it wasn't angry enough for punk. It was just lame through yeah. and through. Yep. No and doubt. so that was what they did on this demo. Uh, a lot of the lyrics that were the worst were contributed by Dave Mustaine. Um, yeah. He really, at that point, just was doing sexual lyrics, basically, was what he was doing uh, at that time. And that's what he contributed. But then some changes started to come to Metallica. Yeah. In 82, um, Cliff Burton uh, it, comes on as their new bassist. Um, and Cliff Burton, for, you know, for those that know Metallica, um, is a name that today, still all these years later, and it's been decades since he has had been with Metallica um, because of his death, but we'll get to that later, um, adds a, um, a depth and an influence, in fact, some classical music influence, which would continue to have influences with Metallica long after Cliff Burton's time. But in, in any ways, 82 Cliff Burton comes on to uh, uh, join song with the band. Um, and <laughs> Dave Mustaine, who um, was a little bit free with the alcohol, liked, liked to drink uh, a bit. Um, and uh, again, just didn't, 
certainly once Cliff comes on the scene, you just have this massive contrast between uh, the the depth of these two guys, and it just becomes apparent that Dave Mustaine isn't um, kind of doesn't fit with the future. Yeah, Dave Mustaine becomes he he forms Megadeth almost as a as a backlash against Metallica. Remember, Metallica's first album is Kill 'Em All, mm-hmm. and his first album with Megadeth is Killing Is My Business, and Business <laughs> Is Good, uh, and that's kind of his first punch at Metallica. Yeah. And so there's there's a long conflict between. There is. Dave Mustaine and Metallica, but I, I think in the end that he grows better. He, his lyrics get better. He becomes a better musician and he really picks up and takes up the mantle of that Black Sabbath, new wave of British heavy metal yep. and yep. takes that to another level. And also in the early 2000s, Dave Mustaine becomes a Christian, um, which is just kind of a bizarre thing. And I don't know mm-hmm. what exactly he follows or anything like that and yeah. how he structures that. But he at least claimed to have become a Christian uh, in the early 2000s. Yeah. I saw him in concert at just uh, several years ago at the Experience Hendrix tour. He was one of the guitarists and uh, he just was is an incredible incredible guitar player, yep. even playing the blues and playing Hendrix, doing stuff yeah. like that. Uh, he was there and, at that particular and, concert. And Megadeth is great in its own right. Um, oh, yeah. But but certainly there is there are significant differences between the two. I've, I've always really enjoyed Megadeth, but they've never they, they never captured me right the way that Metallica did. And so when Dave leaves, then he is replaced by the silent assassin. That's that's what I call him. I don't know if anyone else calls him that. Uh, Kirk Hammett, um, who is just... I don't know if I've ever heard the guy say more than 10 words at a time, but the the man on a guitar is just unreal. Unreal. Yeah, this ha- this no really words. forms Metallica. I yep. mean, this does form Metallica. It rounds them out. Cliff, he introduced these technical aspects that others hadn't. Kirk really brings some bluesy stuff to it. I mean, he really is able to play the blues. Listen to a song, a more recent one, like... Um, a blind man's cry that the Metallica does a version of, and you really hear that that Kirk can play the blues as well. And so we see that Metallica becomes more complex, mm. and yet at the same time more soulful. And then they start playing faster and tighter. And nobody knows exactly how that happened, <laughs> but according to some of the the reports of it, Lars would he when he was playing the drums, he would speed up during the song, and people would just follow <laughs> along, just have and they would realize on. it sounded amazing really really fast and they developed this super fast type of a picking and everything like that Mm -hmm. i don't know for sure but they develop this brilliant fast metal that really is exemplified on the the 1983 album kill them all and that was the the first album kill them all yeah there's still some mindless macho metal uh there's this song called metal militia that is this (laughs) terrible song on there but you start to see this growth in it because there's a growth in what they're doing james hetfield he took two songs they'd done before mechanics which was one of dave mustaine's really kind of body vulgar uh ones that he had and he turned it into the four horsemen (laughs) which draws from the bible and uh, he turned jump into the fire which was another one of dave mustaine's really kind of vulgar songs he turned it into a song about the final judgment and so Mm. you see this growth where they're they're taking these songs and they're they're taking them a different direction and they kind of decide to avoid sex in their lyrics and lars ulrich one time the way he put it was he says we have nothing against sex Sex in our lyrics, though, is just another cliche that's easily avoidable, as is Satanism. He just points yep. out, look, we just started doing that. That's not what we're doing. But one of the results that they probably didn't plan or think about is that they had female fans that were actually committed to their music, who liked their music, that were more likely to enjoy it because it wasn't this very macho, yeah. sexual lyrics that, uh, that that they had had before. And so you've got here what happens on the Kill 'Em All album is that you've got the anger, the speed, the stripped down sound of punk, and you've got the complexity of the new wave of British heavy metal. And then you've got this staccato tightness and speed that nobody had ever really heard before. Whereas punk and new wave of British heavy metal had been opposites. They bring them together and then they add it and do it faster and better than anyone had done it before. Which would also contrast a lot with another thing going on at this time, uh, you, you know, early, especially mid eighties, um, with glam rock, which everyone knows Timothy and I, we love, like we love ourselves some 
cheese ball glam 80s heavy metal um but metallica is 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 very much uh and intentionally the opposite of that right they they left behind not only the lyrical cliches that timothy mentions but things like outrageous costumes and you know makeup and um a, a certain uh a certain type of uh of show and set and whatnot um yeah, they they, you know, uh, cut off cut off t shirts and uh, jeans. I mean, they they look like your next door neighbors who like to drink a lot of beer and play loud music. They really do, and that's one yep. of the things I think is attractive to people. You look at them, you're like, I can look like that. I can that's right. actually look like that. You don't look at Striper and say, I can look like that. Nor do you even say, I want to look like that. Right. <laughs> you, but you look at Metallica right. and you're like, man, those guys. And as they've aged, it's like. I could still look like. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look. <laughs> listen, Kirk Hammett does wear the occasional leather pants, right? I mean, I'm that's never going to be me, but it was, it was never, you know, it's it, it's it's still completely different from everything else that was uh, around him at that time. So, so you have this this really creative moment here with Kill 'Em All, in which all these things come together, and they are playing this at a level of skill that just yep. hadn't been heard before. This yep. was new. This was different. They follow this album up with Ride the Lightning, mm-hmm. and you start to see these themes of mortality. That really becomes one of the things, looking inward, thinking about your own mortality, songs like For Whom the Bell Tolls, the song Creeping Death, which is about the plagues of Exodus. You've got that in Ride the Lightning. And then comes in 1986, which is, as we've already established many times, is the greatest year ever for music, they produce what I think is the greatest metal album of all time. I have which never is heard Master you say Master of that. Puppets. It Master is the Puppets. greatest metal album of all time. Oh. Now, I'm not saying it's the greatest rock album. I'm not even right. saying it's the greatest metallic album of all time. But in terms of a pure metal record, there is nothing like master of puppets nor will there ever be the sheer complexity and speed that they're playing in terms of on the guitar trying to do that is is just they're doing something that's almost from another planet Mm. it feels like at times and they really their their lyrics mature mortality anger introspection struggling with issues of sanity and and things like that all of those things that they're looking at there's a maturity of that in that and it's the first heavy metal album ever to be selected for the archives of the library of congress as something that is of cultural significance to the point that it needs to be preserved but Hmm. it is truly brilliant just even thinking about master of puppets which is about drug addiction the lyrics of that pain monopoly ritual misery chop your breakfast on a mirror taste and you will see more is all you oh need God, i mean so just good. powerful <laughs> so lyrics good. describing addiction and the struggles of that in the song master of puppets it's it's just a phenomenal album we could do one entire episode just on the album master of puppets if we wanted to yep, but absolutely. that year 1986 for them also is horrible horrible tragedy yep. there's this bus crash in sweden the bus falls on top of Cliff Burton, there's guilt that they feel in the midst of that. The way this happened was they'd each drawn a card to see who would get the best bunk. And he got a particular bunk that he was then thrown from the bus and the bus crushed him in this horrible uh, bus crash in September of 1986. And so this album, that this high point really in terms of metal is followed by this horrible horrible tragedy that happens and jason newstead then replaces cliff burton on the bass he had been in a a band called flotsam and jetsam which interestingly uh flotsam and jetsam that comes from the book the hobbit that's where Mm. that comes from that's a chapter in in the hobbit is is where the name of his band came from but he joins as their new bass player and then They move into this album that really becomes one of the first ones that people start to hear about them on a broad basis. And that is the Injustice for All album in 1988. This is the album that uh, the song One comes from, um, as we've said, becomes their first music video. Um, It's their it's their first song uh, kind of looking at historically that. Um, is suddenly heard uh, from the wider audience, right? It's the the song that moves beyond um, 
just because you know cassette tapes of of their core fans and you know uh obscure college radio stations um and uh in in 89 so again that song propels them for the first time to the top 40 they make it to uh number 35 on the charts i believe um and that doesn't make the mainstream but but it began uh it, it paved the way for when they do release uh, the Black Album. Um, in 89, Rolling Stone magazine names them as, <laughs> this is so awesome, one of the top 10 bands that you'll never hear <laughs> on the radio. I mean, that that says a lot, right? You, mm-hmm. I mean, you think about radio today. I think radio still exists. I don't know because I don't listen to it. Um, but when we think of radio today, it, you think of, any song that becomes popular, which one does become popular, uh, radio just like kills it. Right. Um, and this, this still wasn't the, you didn't, you didn't hear them on the radio, right? You, you, you probably saw them on MTV. You probably had never heard of them before. Um, if you were a certain type of person like 10 year old Garrick, and then you went and got the cassette. Um, and, and, uh, maybe, maybe you got the cassette. Cause again, I didn't, I didn't own a Metallica album until till the Black Album. And at that point, CDs CDs were becoming a thing. Yeah, so what you have is it was making it on the charts. So it was making it on the singles charts. People were buying this, but it still wasn't getting played on the radio, even though people were buying these records by the, by the thousand. But then in 1990, they began recording the album that would simply be titled Metallica. And this is a moment. So Master of Puppets, greatest metal album ever. This one, one of, if not the greatest rock album ever. Yeah. One of the, certainly one of the top five greatest rock albums ever. It's not thrash. It's not pure thrash, but it is no. pure awesome oh, all gosh. the way through the Black Album. It really is. Now so, this album, yeah. Well, Timothy, have you looked at what else came out in 91? Have you? So, so, yeah, I looked. Right? They, it was a month before Nevermind. So one yes. month after this was released, Nevermind gets released. So, so in 1991, uh, Garrick Bailey is is what uh, 13, 13 at this point, um, and I, I I can't go through the full list, but uh, all of these great albums, like like in in. <laughs> For for Garrick's story, uh, it's almost like ninety one could be one of the greatest years ever because you do have Nevermind by Nirvana, you have the Black Album, uh, you have Pearl Jam's Ten, you have Blood Sugar Sex Magic by the Chili Peppers, you have Dangerous by Michael Jackson, which people, including me, still still listening to Michael Jackson at this point. You have Octune Baby by U two. Out of Time by R.E.M. You have Emotions by Ma- Mariah Carey. You laugh all you want, but I had a poster of Mariah Carey from Emotions on my wall. But it was. It was an amazing year. And and often people don't recognize that Metallica, their big breakthrough album comes at the same time as Grunge, Grunge hit it, yeah. is coming. And, and people think that those happened separately, but those actually happened simultaneously. This album, as we said, one of the greatest albums ever recorded. It mm. cost three remixes, one million dollars, and three marriages, because everybody in the band that was gotten that was married got divorced during this album. So this was a clearly a stressful album. A lot of things were coming together in positive ways, but also negative ways. But by this point, Metallica had sold seventy million albums, but they'd not been on mainstream radio ever. That's 70 wild. millions all albums, and they had never been on mainstream radio. And for the first time, here they are making the radio and wide rotation on MTV, just constant rotation on MTV as well. Uh, Enter Sandman, Sad But True, some of the greatest songs ever, as well as the one we're looking at today, The God That Failed. Mm. And so we see on this album these themes of mortality, of inward darkness, we start to see this theme that's only been hinted at before in Metallica's music of this anger and faith and struggle to forgive. You start yeah. to see that. That really works its way out on their later al- albums as well. But you yeah. first start to see it on this particular album that has the song, The God That Failed. And and many listeners hear this as if it's a an, an atheistic anthem. But 
if you think this is an atheistic anthem, this song, The God That Failed, you've missed the point of this particular song. Yeah, we got to remember what it, what has shaped uh, Hetfield here. And and also we got to remember that the que- questioning God um, or, or even accusing him of, of failing, um, well we've talked about this issue of, of pain and suffering and, and evil. Uh, we've talked about the Psalms and how the Psalms make way and permit and uh, provide a framework even for the entirety of, of human emotion, including um, accusations, right? Of, of God being absent of abandoning of forsaking. Um, that's no different than the words of the God that failed. Um, and so you, in fact, if you're an atheist, um, you don't believe in a God to accuse of failing. Right. Um, and so, yeah, that's, it's, it completely misses the point. Uh, um, and J- knowing James's story makes sense of a lot of what goes on here. Yeah. This song is about his mother who died of this cancer that probably could have been cured mm. and she died trusting God in her own mind, at least. And yet she died of this. And so in his mind, the God that she prayed to the God that she was appealing to, whatever that was that failed, that was a failure. And, and as Garrick already pointed out, this is really important for us to understand that Job cries out against God. Job cries out and, 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 says his feelings, speaks his feelings that God has abandoned him, all these Mm -hmm. things. And at the end of the book, it says, my servant Job did not sin with his mouth. So even in these, in these times of struggle and pain that Job is asking questions and Job is saying, God, it seems like you've abandoned me. It seems like you failed me. He was not sinning. He was not sinning. And at the end, God shows up. And so when we hear something like this, this is not an atheistic anthem. Mm -mm. This is rather a wrestling with a failure of what he thought God would do, or what at least his mother thought God would do in her circumstances. From his perspective, she trusted in God and it cost her her life. And And that's the lyrics of the song, what he's getting at. His so in Hetfield's Job moment, right, um, that he records in the song, uh, you have this line. Trust you gave, a child to save, left you cold and him in grave. Deceit, deceive, decide just what you believe. I see faith in your eyes. Never you hear the discouraging lies. I hear faith in your cries. Broken is the promise, betrayal. The healing ha- hand held back by the deepened nail, follow the God that failed. I mean, wow. that's, that's, it's, it's absolutely a reflection on, um, probably the most traumatic point in his life to that point, uh, I, I would guess. Um, and notice it says about a child yep. in that he's probably talking about himself. Yep. Um, there's a sense in which he died in that moment of her dying. There's something about him that he rightly recognized. There's something about in himself that died yeah. as well. And so I want us to wrestle with this question of, did God fail in this particular instance? Is this really a failure of God? What is it a failure of that James Hetfield is, is wrestling with? Because yeah. he says the healing was held back by the deepened nail. Yeah. That's what it says in the song over and over. That's one of these repeated lines in it. The, the healing was held back, he says, by the deepened nail nail. And so it seems like he's saying there that God's weakness or God's suffering kept him from healing mm-hmm. James's mother. And and the truth is, if we're honest with ourselves and with one another, we know that we've all felt this way sometimes. God, why didn't you act in this situation? Yeah. What kept you from saving this circumstance? What help, What was it that you didn't help this child? Why didn't you let this happen in the way I prayed for? And we wonder, is God weak? Is God not as good as we thought? What is holding him back? And that's what he's wrestling with. What's holding you back? This deepened nail. What is it, God, that held you back from helping my mother when she cried out to you? And and the fact is that when that does happen in in our lives, we we honestly don't know 
yeah. what it is, what God's reason is. Even as Christians who have a, a faith and a belief in this, we don't know all of God's reasons. We do know this, that God's plans are greater than we can see. And we know that in Christ, he enters into our sufferings and makes it his own, makes our sufferings his own. We do know that. But he's crying out something that we don't have the answer right. to. Yep. It really feels like, I mean, when I look at the words, especially the line that, that we read, um, it strikes me as a, as a song that he's singing to his mother. Um, it, it, you know, trust you gave his mother a child to save, left you cold. Uh, so she dies, but, and him in grave, right? Mm -hmm. Not an actual death, but the, the effect of, of this moment on his life. And, um, and that line held back by the deepened nail, uh, we know that that would be true. Um, if Jesus had stayed dead, right. If he hadn't been raised from the grave, um, uh, that that the deep nail neither held him back um, from resurrection, uh, from ascending uh, to the Father, um, from and from and from all that follows, S uh, the giving of the Spirit um, to begin or to continue um, the work of redeeming people uh, to to break His kingdom into our world, right? Um, we know that to be truth. Uh, it sounds like in this moment <clears throat> that, that that's not truth for, for, for Hetfield, right? And we have to remember at this point, again, Christian science, what the teaching of Christian science is. If we go back to their writings, there's one I found from 1893, trying to think through what their official theology is mm -hmm. on this issue. What resurrection is, the resurrection of Jesus is for Christian scientists, is that uh, that that basically Jesus, according to one of their own authors, Jesus was merely asserting the great fact of man's being that no man can die. And in other words, what they're saying in that is what the resurrection was is a recognition that death is only an illusion. So they don't believe in Christian science that the resurrection happened because God supernaturally acted. They don't believe that. Rather, what they believe is that Jesus recognized and asserted the fact that nobody actually dies at all, that death is merely an illusion. And what James Hetfield rightly recognizes yeah. here, he rightly recognizes, is that death is real. It's not mm -hmm. an illusion. His mother truly was gone from him. That's really happened. And so in his crying out, remember the context in which he's hearing this and with the context in which his mother is praying for healing is a context in which they believe that even the resurrection is merely yep. asserting that you don't really die. And in that, when he says that your hand is held back by the deepened nail, it actually makes sense because if that were true... If God didn't ever supernaturally act to raise Jesus from the dead, then it is exactly right yep. that that deepened nail, the death of Jesus on the cross, it really, truly is is the end of things. Yep. Because James Hetfield has realized that this whole claim that you overcome death by saying death is an illusion, that that is utterly, That's completely one. false. And so what we would say to James Hetfield of 1990, 1991 is that it's not God that failed, um, but it was a, a lie, uh, a lie about God um, that was revealed to not be true. It was a false God uh, that your mother did put her faith in, her trust, um, and that the there were promises that were broken. There, there was betrayal, but they weren't from God. They were from a, a belief system that... Um, had had long left the truths of scripture that the the truths that God had revealed about himself. Yeah, the tragedy in this really was his mother placed her ultimate trust in in something that was false. And there's an equal tragedy, but it's not the end at this point of this tragedy. And it's that James Hetfield, he's rightly left Christian science behind. He recognizes that doesn't offer any truth. 
but he's still in so many areas of his own life. He seems to be chasing a, a false vision of God. And a lot of times we talk about these people and they're, they're dead. James Hetfield is yeah. still very much alive. And, and so as I think about this, I think about it prayerfully recognizing yep. that there are things that, that could happen and there are things that God can do to open his own heart and mind and life to the truth of God. But right now where he's at seems to be in terms of God and forgiveness is he says, I believe in a higher power. Yes. He, she, or it, I see it everywhere. If I choose to see it, it makes me feel better. And so on the yeah. one hand, he believes in God. <laughs> he does yeah. believe in God of some sort, but it's not the God of the Bible. It's, it's a God of his own imagination, just like the God of Christian science was a God of Mary Baker Eddy's imagination. And this God of his imagination, what that God can't provide, among many other things, yeah. is, is forgiveness. And as we look at James Hetfield, if there's one thing he knows he needs is forgiveness. He knows he needs that. And that's something that a he, she, or it higher power cannot give him the forgiveness that he needs. And yeah. he knows it. He knows he needs it. Part of Hetfield's story, um, part of part of his searching, right, and his his digging and his asking questions, and um, it has a dark side to it. Um, after the Black Album, <clears throat> um, alcoholism just takes grip or or more of a grip and it spins further and further out of control until 2001 right 10 years later he's he's married at this point um, but 2001 his wife kicks him out uh and he says that losing my family that was the thing that scared me so much that was the bottom i hit that my family is going to go away because of my behaviors that i brought home from the road I didn't want that uh, as part of as part of my upbringing, my family of uh, my family kind of dis disintegrated. Um, and so he he became at that point, in his own words, a reborn straight edge. Right. Um, but for those that know his story, they know that that scared him straight uh, and, and that he can talk about a of being reborn. Um, but it's also kind of a, just a false front. And it was, it was built on, uh, his, his own efforts of trying to get it right after almost losing his family. And, you know, um, by 2019, he has a, and I think there was another one, maybe even before this, but he has a major relapse and has to go back into, um, rehab. Uh, and, and when asked about that, about, he said this about the things that he did when he, he drank, right? He says, you wouldn't really like me if you knew my story. If you knew what horrible things I've done, shame is a big thing for me. And I'm just like, brother, welcome to the club. Like, that's all of us. Uh, you, wouldn't, I've, you wouldn't like me if you knew my story, if you knew what horrible things I've done. Um I'm I'm right there with you, James. The difference is, is um, I I know of a, a, a whole nother story. I, I know of a a whole nother reality. I know a truth uh, that speaks into um, those things I believe about myself. And I think we have to recognize in ourselves and in our churches, we are so full of this feeling, and everybody hides it. Mm. Like every one of us, you're at church and we're singing. And if we really are honest with ourselves and think if these people around me knew my heart, they would hate me. Yeah. And we all have to recognize that that is our human condition. And we can yeah. do one of two things with that. We can build walls up and try to hide it or and live with that shame, or we can own it yeah. and take that shame to the people of God and ultimately to the cross of Christ. And he says, shame's a big thing for me. Yep. And if we're honest, it's a big thing for all of us. Yep. And it's what nothing of this sort of vague God that he has an idea of this vague higher power can't satisfy that hunger in his soul. And you, you also see the struggle with shame in what I consider to be the most shocking video 
that James Hetfield has ever done. It's not shocking in the way you think of shocking. It shocked me that he did this video. But there's a particular video in which he did an anti-pornography documentary. Hmm. And you may not realize this. James Hetfield did. He narrated this anti-pornography documentary called Chasing the Cardboard Butterfly. Hmm. And uh, it's it's a powerful video. Yep. And this whole thing of chasing the cardboard butterfly, it comes from a, a bit of research that actually won a, a several prizes uh, years and years ago in which they they recognize that certain butterflies, they they will try to mate based on the attractiveness and the colors and the size of a particular butterfly. And so they made cardboard butterflies that were brighter than any of the others. And, and what they found after a while is that the, the butterflies would no longer mate with one another because they were enamored with these fake butterflies. Mm -hmm. And the point of this, this documentary is that's what pornography does. It's, it, it gives this something fake Yep. that people then prefer to what is good and beautiful and true and real. And this particular documentary narrated by James Hetfield begins with Adam and Eve in the garden, and yeah. it ends with scientific evidence for the harm that pornography causes. And it shows just a lot of movement on his part, because obviously, as, as we may know, in the 80s, 90s, and into the early 2000s, he's very connected with a lot of things that we're not even going to, to mention on, on our podcast. But clearly, there has been some sort of change in him for him to narrate something like this. There's a an openness in James Hetfield um, that has been has been there for a while, and it's looked different throughout a story, but. But I've all, I've just always felt it and and have enjo enjoyed seeing it grow and develop and like you prayerfully hopefully um, uh, desiring asking for God to just grab hold of him um, in his lifetime. Uh, but he's got this openness to the the beauty of the true God, right? Um, and, and I think some of that seems to be because he he hasn't yet been able to find anything else that um satisfies that that speaks to at least not permanently this guilt and shame that he struggles with um he's so he's certainly not christ centered right but he is uh to steal a line from flannery o'connor he is christ haunted and um and i i get that and i and i love that and um and i and i think that there's also something important for those of us who are believers to see in his story um that it's this it's this feeling of guilt and shame that keeps him open and searching uh and um and all of that but he also he also has an awareness an explicit awareness that he's thrown out there in public where he's admitted right he he's admitted this struggle with you wouldn't like me if you really knew and and i my concern for me personally for believers is that that's something that we're aware of and we keep inside right um there is there's language that uh, our church started to use, I, I don't remember what year, but it became so much of the language we use that uh, when you use a restroom stall, you will, you'll see uh, material um, that has, has this phrase in it. And that's that it's okay to not be okay. Right. And, and that that's something that we need to hear over and over and over. And not only do we need to hear it, but then we need to be people who also practice it for others right we need to believe that this is true that god truly loves us in a way that that this is true it's okay not to be okay um and that when god gets a hold of you he won't leave you that way but you don't have to become okay uh in order to come to him right and, and that we need to provide that same type of space for those of us around us, for for believers in our church, uh, for the 
quote unquote insiders and f- for the folks who um, walk in from the streets uh, that we must be marked by this type of genuine welcoming, genuine love for all. Um, and we need to rehearse those words that it's okay uh, to not be okay. Um, I think if we did that more, that more folks like James Hetfield would would find a home in the church and and would see this witness um, that is very much not the witness that he got growing up, but he would see the witness to the to the beauty of the true God, and uh, and I'm confident would be compelled compelled to um, to place his trust in that God. And you see that what he's seen as the public face of Christianity often is the televangelists or things like that. You see that in the song Leper Messiah, for example, and you've seen that, or he's seen this, his growing up, what he saw growing up of this, uh, this sort of illusory world uh, that's clearly false, that is, is, is based in that. Yeah. You get the feeling that he hasn't necessarily seen authentic and true Christianity. Yeah. We just get that sense that he, he perhaps has never seen that. And we do have to have that in our churches, this attitude of what does somebody do who is filled with guilt and shame? What do they do? And, and because we don't have a place to put that sometimes, then people who are addicted, they keep it hidden until it gets out of control to the point that it can no longer be kept hidden. And then by that time, it has so devastated their lives that we are left picking up pieces Mm. that have just exploded everywhere at that point. But Mm. sometimes, not always, but sometimes the reason it got held in so long was because we didn't have any spot in the church to put that. And we didn't have any language to use. We didn't have anything in our liturgy that let people own their addictions and bring those forward or talk about their shame or talk about their guilt, talk about the abuse they've experienced, talking about all those things that are uh, impacting their lives. We didn't provide a spot for yeah. that. And we have to do that yep. in the church and and people's lack of forgiveness. And that's another one of these themes in Hetfield that we see is this struggle to forgive, the struggle to forgive his parents. And he has said that his most personal song is the song Unforgiven. Mm. And I find it fascinating that he has not done just one version of this song, yeah. but sort of three variations yep. of this. Unforgiven, Unforgiven 2, and Unforgiven Three, and the progression in those three songs is very telling. If you look at the first one on the Black Album, Unforgiven, he refuses to forgive his abusive parents. He is angry. It's clear that he's angry. He declares abusive parents to be unforgiven. Now, even in that, I think he recognized something was wrong with that because I don't know exactly when it was, but he started at the end of that song of saying to the audience, forgive yourself. And he Hmm. would make a motion like a priest, like a priestly type of emotion and saying, forgive yourselves as if he was giving absolution to the crowd. But this first song, angry, refusing to forgive. Mm. The second one is he sees himself as somebody who's unforgiven, and he finds himself in community with other people who are unforgiven. He's dialoguing with somebody else who's unforgiven. He's in a community of, of outcast, we might see, with another person. They're both unforgiven. By the time he gets to Unforgiven 3, he forgives everyone else, but he cannot forgive himself. He cannot forgive himself. And that is a powerful statement of where he's at. And in 2008, there's this interview with David Frick. And in this interview, James Hetfield takes his daughter to St. Petersburg to see the Rembrandt painting. You know, I've talked about this painting before, The Return of the Prodigal Son. And while he's there, he tells his daughter that's his favorite painting in the world. So James Hetfield's favorite painting is Rembrandt's The Return of the Prodigal Mm -hmm. Son. And it's his favorite because when he was in rehab at one point, one of the times he was in rehab, one of the directors of the rehab center had asked him who he was in the story of the prodigal son. I find it fascinating because it makes me think that there may have been some Christian influence on him in rehab, perhaps even. 
But James's answer to that is I'm all three. I'm all three. I'm the father who forgives. I'm the son who needs forgiveness. And I'm the older brother who can't forgive. Mm. I'm all of them in that painting. And that again, from just uh, you know a few years ago, that's just a revealing thing again to see of what's going on in James Hetfield's heart and in his in his life. Yeah, I think we see echoes of that, um, in his you know in 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 other songs, um, like the song the the Thorn Within, right? Has that line, um, I I I am the secret. I am the sin, I am the guilty, I am the thorn within, right? I mean, um, he that's just one of the things, I know a lot of musicians are like that, but I'll tell you that a lot of my favorites are the ones that um, are explicitly uh, processing, right? What's, what's going on in their lives, their hearts. Um, just explicitly in their songs as it's happening real time in their life. And, um, the, the, yeah, the realness, the openness, the rawness that, that comes with, um, that vulnerability, that honesty through your art, um, is very compelling to me. Mm -hmm. And in that, as we think about this vulnerability he shows Mm -hmm. in this conversation about, the return of the prodigal son and the song, the thorn within we just, it brings us back where it should to the gospel (laughs) that remember that what we're talking about in the gospel is that Jesus became sin for us. He became shame for us. He became guilty for us. He took the thorn within upon himself and carried our guilt Second Corinthians five twenty one, the one who knew no sin became for us sin that we might know the righteousness of God. And, and Christians have dealt with this issue of shame and sorrow for sin through the ages. This isn't something that just in the modern age we've started thinking about or talking about. This is something that's been around for a long time. I, one of my favorite quotes from John Calvin in the Institutes of the Christian Religion is in book three, chapter three of the Institutes. And here's what John Calvin says. He says, sorrow for sin is necessary, but it should not be perpetual. Quit the anxious and painful recollection of your ways. Arise to a remembrance of divine blessings. And when you reflect on your own meanness, reflect also on your Lord's goodness. When you reflect on your own meanness, Reflect also on your Lord's goodness. That's the message that James Hetfield and and all of us need to hear is that when you reflect on your own meanness, reflect also on your Lord's goodness. But that only comes by means of the gospel, by means of union with Christ, by means of trusting Christ in which we become united with Christ in such a way that when the Father looks at us, he can think nothing less of us than he thinks of Jesus himself because he sees us in the perfect righteousness of Jesus. And and James Hetfield keeps struggling with forgiving himself, forgiving himself. We see an openness in Hetfield, but, but also in his story, we see, um, that while he's, o- while he sees the problem, he's, and he's, he's open to healing uh, and forgiving and whatnot. Um, he's also trying to do it himself. Right. And again, this is, this is a message, not for just the unbeliever, but for believers alike, because we operate that like that so many times, so many times we're trying to, uh, fix ourselves, make ourselves better. We've been, um, we have been scared into wanting to be better, scared by our own sin, maybe scared by our, um, false thought of, thoughts of God and that he will, um, suddenly change his mind and consider us unlovable, right? That will out sin him. Um, and that's just, and it's not the case. And, and, and so we, we are driven by these fears, um, uh, and fears of being found out. And so we do try to f- do so many things of our own power. And, and the truth is you, 
you can't fix yourself and you don't have to, and you, you don't have to forgive yourself. We find forgiveness in the sacrifice of Christ. We find forgiveness um, in God, the God that never fails.